Good afternoon. Welcome to today's webinar entitled Counseling Your HPV Positive Patients, A Clinician's Perspective, presented by Dr. Audrey Garrett, Gynecologic Oncologist, Willamette Valley Cancer Institute, Springfield, Oregon. Following her talk, we'll have a short question and answer session. You can ask questions at any time during the presentation via the web using your Ask a Question box. If you should require technical assistance, type your inquiry into the tech support box located on the left side of your screen and click the Send button. If you are disconnected from the webinar, you can log on again using the instructions provided to you for accessing. If you cannot log back on, please call 877-843-9272. It is now my pleasure to turn the webcast over to our speaker, Dr. Garrett. Good afternoon and thank you for sharing this afternoon with me. We're here to talk about how to counsel your patients regarding their HPV positive test. First a message from Hologic. So today we would like to help you understand why HPV testing is an integral and important part of cervical cancer screening. And with that comes the ancillary need to know how to discuss the meaning of an HPV positive result with your patients. And the converse of that when their HPV test is negative is how to appropriately reassure them that they can return to routine screening intervals. Before we start this afternoon, I'd like to hear who you are and what best describes your healthcare role. If you could go ahead and answer, that'd be fabulous. Great, it looks like we have a, quite a few OBGYNs this afternoon. We probably should have delineated what the other category really broke down into. And some midwives, that's great. Okay, as another starter question, we'd like to know how you're currently using HPV testing in your practice. Are you using it as a screening test combined with PEP cytology in women over 30 or co-testing? Are you using it as a reflex test when your cytology shows an atypical squamous cell of undetermined significant result? Are you using it as both co-test and reflex testing? Are you not using it? Okay. Most people are using it as a combination of co-testing and reflex. But a pretty significant group are not using it at all. And I'm going to try to introduce you to why I think it is absolutely essential and essential to our role in cervical cancer screening. So next, I'd like to know who in your practice counsels patients on their pap test results. Is it the physician? Is it a nurse or nurse practitioner in the office? Is it a combination of nurse and uh, physician involvement? Do you just send out letters? Do you use your patient portal? What other ways are there to contact your patient? Okay, so a fair number of physicians are the ones getting on the phone and letting their patients know. That's great. And then, who in your practice counsels patients on their HPV results, not just their cytology results? Again, is it the physician, the nurse or nurse practitioner, both, a pamphlet or a letter, or some other method? Perfect. Okay. So, with no further ado, I'd like to move into the, the talk itself and really introduce you to what is probably the thorniest issue in the cervical cancer screening and HPV counseling conundrum presently in the United States, and that is the fact that HPV is a sexually transmitted disease. And not only is it a sexually transmitted disease, but it is the most common sexually transmitted in the, uh, disease in the United States with over 20 million Americans currently infected. There are about six million new cases per year, and you can certainly reassure your patients who are HPV positive that they are well within good company as 80% of adults who have ever had sex have come in contact with or been infected with at least one HPV type by age 50. And often when I'm talking with a patient, I'll even bump that number up a bit because 
It probably is limited to 80% simply by virtue of the fact that we're not serologically testing all of our patients. And so there is a feeling that the vast majority, close to 95%, probably are uh, able to manifest some uh, way, shape, or form of prior HPV contact. So more about HPV and its role as a sexually transmitted disease. Not surprisingly, it, uh, its peak prevalence is during the adolescence and young adulthood where other sexually transmitted diseases are also rampant. So amongst the sexually active 15 to 24 year olds, we see a lot of sexual activity and a lot of sexually transmitted diseases. 74% of the HPV infections annually occur in this age group, and about 10 million are currently infected. Now, I'm gonna give you these numbers, and I talk to my patients about this as well, but certainly we don't have 10 million new cases of cervical cancer annually, so something has to happen to that HPV other than just cause cervical cancer. And we do know from a lot of very good epidemiologic data that in newly sexually active female university students who have agreed to participate in these studies, 90% of these new infections clear within two years and at least 50% clear in less than a year, which means that they wouldn't have even been picked up on an annual pap smear screening regimen. Interestingly, we're now seeing that over tw about 20% of these infections that seem to have cleared are subsequently redetected a year later. So we definitely know that the immune system and the balance of viral titers in these patients probably pr plays a role in our ability to detect HPV at any given time. Now with this slide, you can easily see that HPV and HPV's prevalence totally outstrips the prevalence of gonorrhea and chlamydia. Now I'm coming from Eugene, Oregon, speaking from here now, the home of the ducks. We have a large university here and we know by epidemiologic study in our town alone that about 25% of the co-eds will test positive at some point during their college career for gonorrhea and chlamydia. And based on epidemiologic data like that, testing for gonorrhea and chlamydia has absolutely been rolled into the routine recommendations for well, well person care in this age group. So it's not at all surprising that HPV would also, with this type of prevalence, have recommendations for ongoing routine screening. Now our patients who are older than 25 will be happy to see that the prevalence of high risk HPV does not remain as high as it is in that 15 to 24 year old age group. And in fact, as the, um, as the woman ages, her risk of uh, testing positive for high risk HPV drops significantly. And this may be because her immune system is able to rise to the challenge of the HPV that she's encountered, or possibly she is simply not increasing her rate of acquisition of new viral subtypes as the newly sexually active and more uh, variable younger population might be. You'll also see in this graph that the two lines that we have showing here intersect right about age 30. And this is not an accident at all and is part of the recommendation and reasoning behind the choice of the age 30 for co-testing because as the prevalence drops for high-risk HPV positivity, the value of knowing if somebody is positive or negative rises. So you don't really have to test somebody earlier on if the prevalence is so high that it's not gonna be a very valuable test, but later on, if it's more predictive of their risk for cancer, it can be easily incorporated into screening recommendations. When we were just doing cytology pap smears, it was pretty easy to just send out a note annually saying, hey, your pap smear is normal, great, see you next year. And there was really none of the overlay of whether or not a patient had a sexually transmitted disease. In fact, I'll often tell, tell folks that I'm speaking with that if they really don't think that their patient is at risk for HPV, then why are they even doing a pap smear annually? That's for the, pa the docs who tell me that pap smears have, quote, always worked for them. Well, if the pap smear has always worked for them, but they can judge whether or not a patient is at risk, and they're very certain that the patient is not at risk for HPV, then really, since dysplasia, or what might show up on a pap smear, is just a cytologic manifestation of HPV, why do they need to do the pap smear at all? So that's just a little bit of food for thought. We used to just send out a note, and I'm not at all expecting that patients today will accept 
receiving a letter with their HPV results as well. But I think, think it serves as a, an opportunity for education, not only for ourselves to become more fluent in discussing what HPV is and to reassure them about the uh, results that have come up on their cervical cancer screen. Now there are a number of different HPV types that are relevant to us in women's, uh, women's health care. We have about 14 high-risk subtypes that are responsible for creating cervical dysplasia and carcinoma. And of those 14, 16 and 18 rise in prominence and importance because they are the most likely to persist and the most likely to cause problems and significant cervical lesions. They also, however, still do share the ability to absolutely disappear from the clinical testing positive realm. On the other hand, there are about 14 low-risk subtypes which can also affect and infect the anal genital mucosa, but they are not implicated in cervical cancer. They do not give rise to cervical cancer. They are responsible for the benign anal genital warts that can cause enough psychosocial and sexual uh, consternation amongst your patients, but they do not cause cervical cancer and thus there is no role for low-risk HPV testing in a cervical cancer screening program. So why is HPV testing important? Well, quite simply, virtually all cervical cancers are caused by high-risk HPV. And as you can see by this slide, HPV 16 alone is responsible for at least 55 percent of cervical cancers worldwide. When you add the, the impact of 16, uh, HPV 18, you have, with 16 and 18 together, responsible causes of, for 75% of the cervical cancers worldwide. There are other high-risk HPV subtypes that have been implicated in cervical cancer, but the additional impact that each individual subtype has on the overall prevalence of cervical cancer is, as you can tell, somewhat less than that of 16 and 18. Thus, it is very important to know whether a patient is high-risk HPV positive uh, to any of the types that could cause cancer, but it is especially important to have the additional information afforded by the Cervista genotyping test that lets us know whether a patient is 16 or 18 positive. Now, lest any of you think that the idea that cervical cancer is linked to HPV is a fly-by-night idea, let me reassure you that it is not. Dr. Harold Zorhausen was recently awarded the Nobel Prize in Medicine in 2008 for proving that HPV is the causative, and, uh, causative agent of cervical cancer. He started hypothesizing about this in the early 70s and first published a paper in 1974 proposing his theory that HPV is the cause of cervical cancer. He continued to work on that theory and published again in 1983, substantiating his hypothesis by showing that his team had extracted HPV-16 from cervical cancer cells. He continued to work to demonstrate his theory and with the benefits of microbiologic techniques and the expansion of computer-based technology, he was able to expand the epidemiologic testing and the high throughput abilities of this testing was able to accumulate data from all over the world and from hundreds of thousands of cervical cancer specimens so that we now know that cervical cancer is definitively caused by HPV and HPV is present not only within every cervical cancer, but in vir within virtually all cervical neoplasia as well. Now that we know that cervical cancer is caused by HPV, we've been able to turn our attention to other cancers that are candidate cancers for causation by HPV as well. And we know that while over 99% of cervical cancers are caused by HPV, a huge percentage of vulvar and vaginal cancers are caused by HPV as well. Penile cancers are also caused to a large extent by HPV, 90% of anal cancers are caused by HPV, and 60% of oral pharyngeal cancers are now known to be caused or related to HPV exposure. This means that the knowledge of HPV is rapidly accumulating and we're learning more and more about HPV and its role in oncogenesis, not only in the cervix. So when I'm talking to patients about HPV and about perhaps their personal HPV positive result, I back up a bit and I really do start to talk about the entire role of epidemiology in HPV and how they personally got it or contacted it. And I'll take that opportunity to let them know about HPV as a virus, 
And I'll, if they are someone who's able to contemplate this kind of information, I'll talk about the fact that there are, at this point, over 100 types of HPV that have been identified. If this confuses them a bit, I might back up a bit and start to talk about the flu virus, which most people are aware of. They're aware that they need a new flu vaccine every year because there's a new flu that seems to be the rampant viral subtype out that year. And then if they start to demonstrate that they're understanding that, I'll talk about the bird flu, which caused a lot of anxiety a couple of years ago, and they can then understand that there are some strains of different viruses that seem to be more virulent than others. And then I'll bring it back to HPV. So we know that 30 to 40 of the 100 types thus far identified, 30 to 40 of them happen to have a predilection for landing on the warm, moist genital mucosa. And of those 30 to 40, 15 to 20 have been implicated in cancer causation. And again, as you can see here, HPV 16 and 18 are responsible for at least 75% of the cervical cancers worldwide. There are other non-oncogenic types that I've already mentioned, such as 6 and 11, that are responsible for warts, but again, they do not give rise to cervical cancer. In the United States, despite everything we know about cervical cancer, despite everything we know about screening programs, and despite everything we know about HPV, we still have over 10,000 new cases of cervical cancer a year, over 4,000 deaths attributable to cervical cancer annually. And that's not where the statistics end. We have over 10 million cases of HPV infection that never even manifest cytologic abnormalities. We have a million cases annually that demonstrate CIN1 and thus re represent trigger points for further testing and colposcopy. And we have another 300,000 to some, some even say 700,000 cases of CIN23 annually that are, as we know, the trigger points for treatment or ablative uh, maneuvers. So we've come quite a long way now, and I'm going to try to introduce you to why HPV testing might be able to allow us to drop those numbers further. We've had some major advances in cervical cancer since our, our father, George Papanicolaou, father of the pap smear himself, um, first did his work in the 20s and 30s and then published his paper in 1941. It wasn't until 1965 that the American Cancer Society embraced and endorsed annual pap smear screening for part of a, woman's, a well woman visit. But not long after that, Harold Zorhausen started his research linking HPV to cervical cancer. Soon thereafter, we were able to look at better ways to prepare a pap smear and actually take the smear out of it. So by 1996, liquid-based cytology was introduced, which allowed the cytotechnologist to have a much cleaner picture of what they were looking at. Shortly thereafter, again, focusing on the HPV relation, there was a uh, the hybrid capture 2 test that allowed us to better speculate on the risk of a significant lesion within an atypical smear, and this was codified through the ALTS trial. Again, knowing that HPV was part of the picture, the virologists had a target and they were able to develop a vaccine, which was brought to market in 2006. And again, shortly after that, increased understanding of the role of HPV 16 and 18 allowed us to develop the um, absolutely relevant test of Servisto, which allows us to genotype our high-risk HPV results to know further what the risk of developing a significant lesion in that specific cytologic specimen is. Despite all of these advances, we still have cervical cancers in the United States. So despite all of the advances from 1950 on, our graph is beginning to level out, and we seem to have reached a standstill with what we can do with cytology alone. This is where HPV comes in. So we've now entered the molecular age of medicine. So we've gone from the conventional pap smear, and I usually like to point this out, that it truly was a smear. It was difficult to look at. It was a smearage where I would take the specimen, smear it on a glass slide, spray it with some compound, and hand it off and happily never have to see it again, but I would just get a nice result back. Well, that meant that the cytotechnologists had to really wade through a lot of other stuff on that slide. And so when liquid-based cytology came onto the market, it was possible to clean up that slide. And you can see in the third picture here that this gives you a much different picture of what you're looking at, gives you a monolayer of cells, 
and the ability to actually examine those cells without having to wade through the other stuff on the smear. The liquid-based cytology also offered a platform where you could do molecular testing as well. And I'll say a little bit about molecular testing here. For anyone who thinks that, again, cytology was all they ever needed, the pap smear always worked for me, and why do I need to do HPV testing, I would remind you that in the 1980s and 90s, we started to do estrogen receptor testing for breast cancers. And there is not an oncologist around these days who would even think of testing, of treating a patient with breast cancer without knowing her estrogen receptor status. Likewise, we have directed therapies against HPV-related oral pharyngeal cancers. They have different chemotherapy regimens and different radiation regimens. We have different chemo regimens for KRAS positive colon cancers, and the list goes on. We have clearly entered a molecular age in medicine at this point. HPV testing also has a number of advantages, three of which are delineated here. HPV testing is much more sensitive than cytology alone. There are all sorts of reasons that cytology alone may not give you your result. And we have known for a long time that conventional pap smears and cytology alone have a relatively high false negative rate. In the United States, with our amazing medical health care system, we've been able to overcome that false negative rate by recommending annual smears. However, if you add HPV testing, you can achieve an up to 100% sensitivity for CIN3 detection, and you can change that false negative rate significantly for an annual screening interval. HPV testing itself also has an incredibly high negative predictive value, almost 100% for CIN3, such that if I test negative for HPV, high-risk HPV today, I know that my risk of having CIN3 is virtually nothing. This then allows women over 30 who have a negative pap smear and a negative HPV test to extend their screening between the interval between screenings out to three and five years. Five years is the new recommendations, and we'll be talking about that shortly. Lest anyone be worried by the fact that I've told you that HPV is a ubiquitous virus, and to translate that into thinking that every single patient that you test for HPV is going to turn positive, I can give you some reassurance out of the Kaiser Group from Northern California, where they found in over 800,000 women that the overall HPV positive test rate was significantly lower than the epidemiologic studies otherwise would have suggested. And thus, their concerns that their clinics were going to be completely bogged down by women wanting to question why, how, when, where, and what their HPV test was were not validated at all. And in fact, in the Kaiser group, they found that the carcinogenic HPV testing had such great reproducibility and so much greater sensitivity than cytology alone that they are embracing it and using it as co-testing. So this is one of my favorite slides. And when I do counsel patients regarding their HPV positive test or their abnormal pap smear and my need to talk to them about HPV, I actually have this slide printed up in my office. It is from a paper published in 2005 in the Journal of National Cancer Institute, and it represents data collected by the NCI. And specifically, it is looking at risk stratification of women who have a negative pap smear at time zero. And it is looking at whether or not you can additionally learn anything more if you add HPV testing to that. And what you see here is that if I test positive for HPV-16 today, even if my pap smear is cytologically negative, I still will manifest a risk, no matter what my personal habits are or who I'm sleeping with, I have a risk of 20% over the next, two, uh, next 10 years of 20% of identification of a high-grade cervical cancer neoplasia or a cancer. If I test positive for high-risk HPV-18, that risk is also significantly elevated, but is lower than that risk if I am testing positive for HPV-16. On the other hand, if I test negative for all high-risk HPV subtypes, my risk over the following 10 years is virtually zero. It's less than 1% that I will develop any HPV-related disease on the cervix, CIN3 or cancer. If I test positive for high-risk HPV, but I am known not to be positive for 16 or 18, my risk is higher than that of the high-risk HPV negative subgroup, but it is still incredibly low. And thus, we do know now that we can risk stratify based on HPV testing in addition to cytology. Furthermore, I'd like you to look at that circle on the graph 
where you see that at just about three years, you can still have a 12 to 13% risk of significant lesions if you're 16 or 18 positive. That means that if you have been relegating a patient on the basis of three successive negative cytologies to a longer screening interval, you may actually miss significant lesions by falsely reassuring a patient on that basis. So I said I'd talk a little bit more about 1618 genotyping, and I'd like to give you a scenario in using this of, in women over 30. So again, if you took a hypothetical group of 10,000 women and you performed co-testing on them, we know that somewhere between 4 and 7 percent, dependent upon which population you're testing, is going to test positive for high-risk HPV. Using the conservative estimate of 7 percent, that will mean that 700 out of this 10,000 cohort will test positive for high-risk HPV, even with the negative, uh, negative cytology test. About 20 percent of those will be known to be high-risk HPV positive 16 or 18. And if you know that they are 16 or 18 positive, you can triage them immediately to colposcopy on the basis, again, of that graph that I just showed you, where you will be likely to pick up a significant lesion in the first couple of years, and certainly over the next 10 years. On the other hand, if you're able to test them for 16 or 18 and find that they are negative, you can reassure them about their relative risk of an immediate significant lesion. What this means is that you can significantly reduce the time to colposcopy for women who are most at risk, i.e. those who have 16 or 18 on their cervix. So to get down to how exactly I counsel my patients, I spend a lot of time with them talking about the facts of HPV, reviewing the epidemiology. I'm a public health physician at heart. I want my patients to understand what a screening test is. I want them to know about HPV and its role in cervical cancer screening. And I really tend to de-emphasize the sexually transmitted disease component. Many patients do come with that question. They've heard about it from friends. They've looked at it on the internet. They've seen it as they're waiting in the grocery store at the check stand. So they know that HPV is a sexually transmitted disease. But I really do try to downplay that. I try to make sure that they don't feel stigmatized by the fact that they're HPV positive. After all, 80% of us who have ever had sex will turn HPV positive or manifest HPV positivity based on some testing, whether or not it's clinically relevant. So it's very important for them to understand that they're in great company testing positive for HPV and that we now need to turn their attention away from the test positive and what that might mean for their psychosexual well-being and turn it towards what it means for their physical well-being and direct what next testing or next treatment that we are going to perform. So when I counsel these patients, as I said before, I have that slide. I go over graphs, I go over epidemiology, I tell them about pap smears, I remind them that they might have changed their telephone more frequently than once every two years and that why wouldn't we want to use a more recent test than something that was devised in the 1920s, that it might be time to move into the molecular era and you'd be surprised how many patients actually can understand that and go along with what you're explaining. You just have to give the patients a chance to understand and make sure that you're fluent with your explanation. In order to demonstrate a couple of actual clinical scenarios and how one might counsel these patients, we thought we would throw in a couple of case studies. So I'm going to challenge you now with a couple of my questions and then I'll let you ask questions of me. So case study number one, and I'd love your participation if you could please. Uh, we have a 34-year-old recently divorced mother of three who has come in for her annual exam. When you saw her last year, you did a pap. It was normal. What do you do this year? Do you do no pap? Do you do cytology alone? Do you do an HPV test alone? Or do you do cytology and HPV testing? Okay, great. So the vast majority of you, 86%, said you would do cytology and HPV testing, which is what I would do. I would not uh, choose number one, which was no PAP, because we don't at this point know her history. We only know that last year's PAP was normal, and that's not enough to reassure me that she does not need cervical cancer screening this year. Nobody chose cytology alone, so I find that interesting. 
Six percent chose HPV alone. Now at this point there is no, uh, no justification or recommendation that includes HPV testing alone without cytology. So while that's something that's being looked at for the future, that's not an appropriate answer at this point. So I would go with cytology and HPV. Follow up to that, this year her pap smear is normal and her HPV test is negative. What do you recommend? Do you do a pap smear next year, just because she's divorced now and you never know what she might be doing? Do you do a pap and an HPV test next year? Do you do an HPV test alone next year? Or do you do no cervical cancer screening for the next five years? Okay. Good, so almost 60% chose no cervical cancer screening for the next five years. And again, not only is that based on the most recent recommendations, which came out in March of this year, but also you can hearken back to that graph, the one that I have printed out for my patients, where um, the, the testing from last year or this year is actually sufficient to reassure her that she is without risk of a significant high grade or cervical cancer lesion over the next 10 years probably. So you can safely extend her interval to five years. Deciding to perform a PAP next year just because she changed her circumstances flies in the face of that recommendation and also flies in the face of the data collected in the CON study that I showed you. PAP and HPV test next year is not cost effective and again when you're looking at a screening test and population based screening you need to look at cost efficacy as well and this is part of what is brought into the recommendations. And PAP and HPV testing not only is not medically necessary, but is also expensive. So that would not be recommended. And again, that's based on this data from that slide that I promised you I would show you again. Again, I have this and print it out for my patients and I hand it to them. Most of them take it home with them too. Case study number two, we have a 52-year-old monogamous G2P2 who comes in for her annual exam. She's experiencing menopausal symptoms, she has hot flashes, insomnia, she hasn't had a menstrual bleed in, 10 month, in 11 months, she has no history of abnormal pap smears, but since you're performing the recommended cervical cancer screening, you perform a pap smear with an HPV test. She has the normal cytology and a positive HPV test. What do you do? Do you move straight on to Culpo? Do you repeat the testing in six months? Do you repeat it in 12 months, or do you move on to genotyping? Okay, so 60% are choosing genotyping, which is what I would have chosen as well. Basically at this point, with a normal cytology pap smear, despite the high risk HPV positivity, you don't have enough data to justify the immediate colposcopy. So colposcopy immediately is not justified at this point. The recommendations, and nobody chose this one, but the recommendations to repeat in six months uh, is incorrect. The recommendations right now are that you could repeat in 12 months, that would be one of the possible options, or my preference would be to know immediately whether or not the patient is 16 or 18 positive so that I could triage those most at risk for immediate colposcopy. And here's the ASCCP genotyping algorithm based on that. So again, you have our patient high risk HPV positive, cytology negative. The recommendations would be, if you're going to go with genotyping, you learn that she's 16 or 18 positive, you can triage her immediately to colposcopy. About 20% of this population of patients will be 16, 18 positive. HPV 16, 18 negative, however, then goes back to the normal tri uh, uh, screening recommendations, and so you'll repeat both HPV and cytology at 12 months, which is also what you would do if you did not know that she was, if you had not performed the genotyping. At 12 months, when you repeat both of those tests, if both are negative, the woman goes back into the routine screening. If the cytology remains negative, but the HPV remains positive, then you go straight to colposcopy. This may be the harbinger of a lesion hid hidden high up in the endocervical canal so that you're not actually accessing the abnormal cells with your cytology broom, but you're able to collect the HPV as it dribbles out. And thus your colposcopy is going to need to include not only a careful examination of the cervix, but also an endocervical curetting.
If your cytology is abnormal next year, any HPV result, it's totally irrelevant what HPV result, you're going to manage that per the cytologic guidelines in the ASCCP. Okay, patient number three. We have a 46-year-old Hispanic G1P1 who had a mildly abnormal pap smear last year. It was ASCUS with reflex HPV positivity, and she had a colposcopy, but that was negative, as was an ECC. She returns today for her annual exam. Since she saw you last, she has heeded your advice and stopped smoking. What do you do for cervical cancer screening today? Do you perform any cervical cancer screening? Do you do cytology alone, an HPV test alone, cytology and HPV, or colposcopy? And nobody's varying. You went straight to the answer, cytology and HPV. So 100% shows that answer, so that's fabulous. The results of her test were PAP negative, HPV negative. What do you recommend for her next cervical cancer screening interval? Are you going to do it again next year? Are you going to wait three years, five years, or is she free for the rest of her life? Never has to get in those stirrups again. Okay, so it's about 50-50 between three years and five years. Um, the recommendations as of March 14th from the United States Preventive Task Force is for an interval of five years in this scenario. Our recommendations prior to this had been three years, so I'll give it to you on both of those answers, but the most recent set of recommendations, only three months old, do recommend five years. And these are these recent guidelines that came out from the United States Preventive Services Task Force, as well as ASCCP, American Cancer Society, ASCP, and they do recommend if you look in that third bar annual pelvic exam and screening with cytology and HPV preferred using co-testing every five years with triage appropriately managed according to results. The guidelines also highlight again that in women under 21 years of age no routine speculum exam or cytology uh, is warranted from a public health cervical cancer screening perspective. I would represent and remind you that Screening tests are for women who are healthy and otherwise at low risk. So if you have a woman who is 19 or 20 and has irregular bleeding, postcoital bleeding, pain with intercourse, she no longer fits that category of asymptomatic and low risk. She does warrant an evaluation and that evaluation not only would include a speculum exam but may well include a pap smear. So these recommendations refer only to the patients who are in the routine screening regimen and are otherwise asymptomatic. Other aspects of the screening guidelines that I'd like to highlight would be that after hysterectomy, i.e. a total hysterectomy, one in which the cervix has been removed, the woman no longer has a cervix. And so if that hysterectomy was performed for something other than a high-grade precancer or a cervical cancer, screening should be discontinued. Also in the HPV vaccinated population recommended screening practices are that no changes be made and that these women be screened according to their, the guidelines for their age group, regardless of vaccination status. So in conclusion, I'd like to help you drink the HPV Kool-Aid and I would like you to understand that as we've moved into a molecular era of medicine, we have a molecular test available to enhance our screening mechanisms for cervical cancer. And because of that, we should adopt an educational approach, not only for ourselves so that we can be fluent and describe this to patients, but also be open to educating patients on these test results and what it can mean. From a clinician's perspective, I think all of this counseling should include and can easily and briefly and expeditiously include a brief overview of HPV, its oncogenic nature, we should be able to reassure patients that while this is a ubiquitous virus, for the most part it clears on its own, although it can become latent, and that risk factors for the development of cervical cancer can be more easily identified with molecular stratification, and this can help us elucidate the next steps for care. So thank you very much for your attention today, and at this point I welcome some of your questions. And we've got a couple already. Okay, let's see. Okay, I have a question here about what, what about clinicians who ask for genotype testing on an ASCUS pap with a high risk HPV positive result? Is this recommended? So I would remind you that any testing that you're going to order and pay for, 
would be testing that would benefit the patient by changing your management. And once a patient already has an ASCUS PAP with a positive HPV test, you're already going to triage that patient with colposcopy. So there is no additional benefit, no incremental benefit to knowing the genotyping results. So there is no uh, benefit to genotyping results uh, in a patient who is already HPV positive for an ASCUS uh, test. Okay. I have a woman in her early 40s who had a previous low-grade dysplasia pap smear, is positive HPV, culpo negative, ECC negative. This year her pap is normal, but she has a positive HPV test, now positive for te uh, type 18. Do I culpo again? So my answer would be yes. She ha has a normal pap smear, but you know that she's HPV 18 positive. You haven't found that lesion yet. This is again a persistent HPV test. We don't know that she was 18 positive before, but um, right now we know that she's cytology um, negative, 18 positive, and you know that in the next three years uh, she's going to find a lesion, so you would definitely culpo again. Let's see. What if I am referred a 24-year-old patient with normal cytology and an HPV positive result? So not that this ever happens because this is against guidelines, right? Their insurance company should never have paid for that HPV test with a normal cytology. But of course, patients come in, they demand uh, things, they want to know if they're HPV positive, and sometimes the easier thing to do is to test them. And so patients like this do show up in my office. So a 24-year-old with normal cytology and an HPV positive result should be referred back for her routine screening interval. She does not need a colposcopy, theoretically, because she has normal cytology. We know that in that age group, there is a high prevalence of HPV positivity, and we know that there is a high clearance of that HPV test, and therefore, we can reassure her, or we should be able to reassure her, that that test is going to uh, resolve itself on its own. Okay, let's see. I have time for probably two more questions. Would you recommend testing a patient who had normal cytology and an HPV negative test last year but has had multiple sexual partners since her last screening? So again, I would refer you to the graph that I showed you from the CON data from 2005 in the JNCI where regardless, in real world testing, and we can never really guarantee that a woman hasn't had new sexual partners or that her significant other has not had new sexual partners in that year, this is real world data. And so there is no reason to repeat her testing just because she has had multiple new sexual partners since her last screening. There should be durability and reproducibility to that negative cytology and HPV negative test from last year. So she would fall back into the routine screening interval recommendations. And I think we have one more question. Given the CON data, so here's someone who knows my favorite slide. Given the CON data showing CIN3 in as early as four and a half months, are the extended intervals of every five years even slightly putting a potential patient at risk? So this is an excellent question and probably goes to the heart of the, the last question as well, where patients, you know, is it possible to acquire a new HPV type and is it possible for some patient to um, undergo a very rapid evolution of a cancer and thus be put at risk by increased intervals. So we know that the CON data actually demonstrated the graph of patients demonstrating disease after the first screening interval. So the next screening interval will actually ha um, capture a slightly lower percentage of prevalent disease. There is a slight risk that uh, a cervical cancer will be missed, but hopefully it would actually be a precancer or a curable cervical cancer, and it could be treated at that point. And again, we have to go back to our public health mindset and realize that screening tests do have a risk and benefit. We have to factor in cost efficacy, and we have to factor in as much um, good as we can, but understanding that we may miss one or two cases. What I would say is that the enhanced a reassurance that one can achieve with a negative HPV test is much better than what we have been heretofore reassuring patients with with cytology alone. So yes, I still feel very comfortable 
allowing those extended screening intervals to five years. Let's see, I'm gonna try one more question. And then I think we're about done. So is there a benefit for clinicians asking for low grade typing in addition to high grade HPV testing? So because, as I said earlier, low grade HPV types are termed low grade specifically because they have not been implicated in oncogenesis, there is no role for understanding or knowing whether or not a patient is low risk HPV positive because it does not actually implicate uh, a, a risk stratification for cervical cancer development. And it, again, will not change your clinical management of that patient to know whether she is low, uh, low risk um, HPV positive or not. So there is no benefit to, to clinicians, and I think we need to be very strong in explaining that to patients as well, that there's no benefit to our knowing, at this point, to our knowing that a patient is HPV 6 positive 